Welcome to another Bass Bros Variety Show Gun Deep Dive. Today we're going to be talking about the Turkish M38 Mauser. Before we get into today's video, I just have to put a disclaimer. We are sponsored by McBride Sisters Wine. Some of the best wine that you can find in all of Napa Valley, California. The wine is women owned. Two women from across the planet come together to make a perfect winery and some of the best wine that you can find in all of Napa Valley, California. The wine has a fullness to it and such a rich creamy taste that you can only find at McBride Sisters Winery. I highly recommend that you check it out. Another disclaimer, I am a mentally sound young man and I have no political leanings whatsoever. So we've got the Turkish Mauser here. As you can see, I've got my Turkish thing set up as well as some different 8mm Mauser there on the table. So the Turkish M38 Mauser chambered in 8mm Mauser or to be specific, 792 by 57. It's some of the most common and cheapest surplus Mausers one can find, at least in the United States of America. However, the term M38 is not actually one used in Turkey, or the country of Turkey where these rifles come from, in any official capacity whatsoever. Uh, it's rather assigned to the rifles, exported out of the country by the nations that received them, primarily the USA. It was a term actually coined by importers who were taking the guns to the US. They just came up with that M38 term, even though there were rifles of this variant, and we're gonna get into it, even though there were rifles that were refitted prior to 38 and after 38. The M38 term is one that is used for classification of any of these rifles that were refitted and standardized starting in 1933 by the Turkish Republic. It's just a real big blanket term. So you can find Turkish Mausers that are still in their original designation and quality and still use their older cartridges or they still have the original length. Let's get into the history of how these guys became a thing. During World War I, the Ottoman Empire, now now modern day Turkey was a part of the Central Powers, allied with the German and Austro-Hungarian Empire, just to name a few of the Central Powers. Even decades prior to World War I, the Ottoman Empire had been purchasing lots of Mauser rifles from Germany, either by contract to be able to make their own or produced in Germany and just buying them and having them shipped to the Empire. Certain models and variants would be different on whether they were produced or whether they came from Germany themselves. They were getting the rights to produce some of models on their own. After the Ottomans' defeat at the hands of the Allied powers, primarily from conflicts between the British and Russian empires, and the Ottoman Empire's transformation into the Republic of Turkey under Mustafa Kemal, under Mustafa Kemal's Grand National Assembly, the country saw rapid change and development in almost all aspects of a nation the army included, as well as their equipment. Whilst not much is known to an official capacity, with war looming in the 1930s, the Turkish Republic had all serviceable rifles slowly standardized to improve logistics within the army. So they had a lot of different Mausers just sitting in the country, different models, tens of different, different models, all with different barrel sizes, barrel lengths, different parts, different calibers, all in varying qualities and conditions. Because of that, seeing that war is looming, they wanted to take all the Mausers they had within the country and they wanted to standardize everything to get their army up to speed after it was kind of demolished after World War I. The M38 could be a huge variety of modified rifles, all with varying value, quality, and slight or more noticeable differences. The one I own, this one here, is actually very common. Uh, weighing roughly about 9.75 pounds, unloaded with a barrel length of about 29.1 inches. The rifle I have here, and let me get it closer to you guys so you can take a look, is a 1940s dated, if it'll zoom in. And the, the stamping on here has been kind of wearing out, but it's a, it's a 1940 K Kala, or to be specific, Kirakola, marked. Uh, Mauser here and Kirikola being the city that this specific M38 the most common M38 rifles 
were all refitted at. That was the city they were refitted in. And this was also, the one I have is also the one that was refitted there as well. And if you can notice, uh, the wood doesn't actually come in a, a kind of color quality of this. I took the time to uh, refinish the wood myself, and I'll put a photo up right now uh, showing the rifle, this rifle, the wood's original look and quality before I kind of gave it this shiny, pretty gloss. Something I've noticed on my rifle, due to its ottoman markings, on, on parts and covered parts of the metal tell me that this rifle is more than likely a originally a 1903 model rifle before it was fitted, resized, and whatnot. Something to note is that the majority of the original rifles pre-refitting caliber were not chambered in 8mm Mauser. So a lot of the rifles they had um, at the time were actually in the 765 by 53 Argentine caliber. For example, I've got, this is 8mm Mauser here, right? Um, so the 765 by 53 was more noticeably much shorter. The 53 in reference probably was about yay big. So because of that, that's something that you'll notice uh, is that they had to change the uh, receiver size on a lot of these because the 1893 as well as the uh, 1903 were in the Argentine caliber, so a much smaller caliber. And for whatever reason, they re-standardized all their rifles to 8mm Mauser, 792 by 57 uh, this is purely speculation on my part, but I think the reason that they refitted and chose 8mm Mauser was during the time of the early to mid to late 30s as well as early to mid 40s. 8mm Mauser was everywhere, especially with their neighboring countries, so it just probably made more sense to standardize it to an ammunition that was not only more powerful, but also easier to get if it ever led to them having to buy ammunition from somewhere else. I've already mentioned that the commonality with the M38s is the change to the 8mm Mauser. Another thing that they all changed it to was on all of the rifles was reduced to 29.1 inches in length. Some of the rifles they had were very, very long. During that transitionary period where there was a lot of armies that had rifles with the absurdly long 30-something inch long barrels, you can actually find M38s with barrels shorter than 29.1 uh, taken from rifles that were originally the carbine models. So about 20 inches, something more like a Car 98K, but most of them are this 29.1 inch a long rifle, and they considered the 29.1 inch to be a short barrel rifle, even though at the time all the other rifles were already shorter barrel length than this here, which is... I mean, just, you know, like, take a look at that. That's, that's very long. I'm also missing the uh, cleaning rod, so I put a paintbrush to hold in the band there. I've, I've told you about the one I own, the rifle I own, which is, this is a very common Turkish M38. But we can list off most common, which is this here, to the more esoteric models that you could find in the M38. Starting off with the most common is the already mentioned K Cali marked Mausers usually being that of 1903 models, cleanly machined at the receiver, varying from as early as 1938 marked to as late as 1946. So a lot of uh, the rifles were actually 1940, 1943, and 1944. Those were the most common years. I've got the 1940. So this is on the earlier end, and there are some 1939s, but they're very rare. Most of them are 1940 to 1946. And a consistency with the K. Kelly rifles is the stamp markings here. Take a look at those, those stampings here. The TC meaning on the very top, Republic of Turkey. The AS and the F is kind of missing. ASFA meaning military factory, Ankara being the capital, and then Kekala being Kerikala, the city where these were refitted. And with the little moon and star to boot to top it off, as well as obviously the year that it was refitted kind of going out there, but it's, it's a 1940. Any under Ottoman markings means it was most likely produced in Anatolia during earlier years, being an older model. The rifles can originally be either Gewehr 88s, 98s, 1893s, or 1903s. 
with most being originally 1903 rifles. However, you can find some 1905 carbines as well. A commonality with the 1893s being that they have a machined notch to allow for the larger 8mm Mauser rounds opposed to the 1903s here that have a clean, if you take a look at that, that machining right there is clean, it's flat. So they resize the receiver completely for the 1903s, for a lot of the 1903s. You can still find 1903s that only have the notch here to allow the rounds to go in, but a lot of the 1893s were machined just with a notch instead of taking more off the receiver. And that's probably because it's an older rifle um, that had more reliability issues, so they didn't want to take as much of the receiver off because if you're taking too much metal off from here, that's reducing the structural integrity of the rifle. The Gewehr 98, and this is something uh, kind of important to mention, most of the Gewehr 98s that were the K Kala uh, were German produced. So the 1903s, the 1893s were Turkish made. Turkish made most of them were Turkish made rifles. Um, there are some exceptions that there were Germans, but those are rare but most of the Gewehr 98s that were converted into this M38 were actually bought from Germany and made in Germany and shipped to the Ottoman Empire and then used and then, then converted. So those are German made and you can actually tell if it's German made or not um, just because you'll be able to see the Waffenbrick uh, stamping. Uh, you can still see the remnants of the stamping on the rifles. That or you can find German proof marks on the barrel, so on and so forth. But most of the time, if you don't see any German markings and you only see Ottoman markings on the underpieces, that usually means it was made in Anatolia. Germans usually have better quality steel, so if you do happen to have a German Turkish Mauser, that usually means it's just a tad bit more valuable. There, and this, this is an interesting part, there's also ATF-marked 1954 rifles, which are almost all World War I Gewehr 98s. The ATF Ankara Tufek Fabrikast, even though it means Ankara Rifle Factory, it was abbreviated to ATF in Turkish, so neat little coincidence. The reason for the refitting after the Korean War, I can suspect, was for either ceremonial use, taking these German, the nicer quality German 98s, and then having them more reminiscent of a kind of the Turkish style rifle that was already popular and that they already had a bunch of, or the consolidation of converting the last of the already pre-chambered Gewehr 98s to fit the size of the other M38s, either by the shape of the wood or the just to make it look all the same. Um, those 1954 ones were done considerably later than all of these other rifles that were refitted in the 40s. Those are just the common models. There are Turkish Mausers that were Car 98s that were in service by the Wehrmacht, or Yugo Mausers, or Czech 98s, even Enfields in 8mm Mauser. This is all just the tip of the iceberg, and to tell you guys about each and every one would take me hours of rambling and a lot of the identifiers I described uh, with the different models being like the 1893 notches or the 1903 kind of clean fitting on the receiver, that, that isn't always the case. A lot of this was just kind of, you know, done on the spot. They weren't really official about refitting a lot of these rifles. So you can find examples of notches on 1903s or clean cuts on the receiver for 1893s and that means that they all have varying degrees of reliability or structural integrity or quality or value. Um, so the, it, it really is a mixed bag with these rifles. And every rifle that you get is kind of has its own little story and mystery to tell that you can kind of uncover on your own. Uh, that even actually applies to the bayonet here that I have. This was actually a 1887 scabbard, and you can kind of tell that because of that kind of curved hilt right here. There's other uh, Turkish uh, M38 uh, Mauser bayonets where they don't have this kind of hilt here, and it's just kind of straight. But this, this curved one here means that it was an 1887 that was taken and shortened to a more reasonable size instead of like a ridiculously long sword scabbard. Just something interesting to note, and I, I can tell that it was taken by the government and then refitted, if it'll zoom in here. You see that? ASFA. So that means the Turkish Republic, right there. Click it right onto the uh, barrel here. 
it doesn't fit super well, and that's probably because this scabbard was actually not designed for this model of rifle, this being a 1903, and this is an 1887 scabbard, which probably was more used on 1893s or uh, Guerre 88s. So it doesn't click on completely, but if you want to learn about all the nitty gritty details about these rifles here, you can find a lot more at turkmausers.com. I got a lot of my extra information from there. Uh, I highly recommend that you give it a look. It also has estimations of production numbers of all the different types of Turk Mausers um, with a serial number chart. Very cool, highly recommend you check it out. Now that the history classification is out of the way, how do these guys shoot? Well, with a barrel of 29.1 inches, it's the exact same as that of the World War I German Gewehr 98s. However, mine is a tad bit heavier than the Guerre 98's average weight of 9 pounds, mine being 9.75. And now, the only Mausers I've fired are the Car 98K and this Mauser here. The World War II 98 Car 98K being much shorter at a barrel length of 23.62 inches versus this 29.1, as well as weighing less than this Turkish Mauser here, uh, allows the Turkish Mauser to have a bit less recoil than its World War II fascist cousin. I'd also assume that it has the capability of being more accurate at longer ranges due to its longer barrel length. Now this is under the assumption that uh, both rifles are at the same quality, barrel quality, because with Milser rifles, you're gonna end up getting some that have really crappy barrels. Luckily the one I have, the bore, is still good on it. This probably has the worst sights of any Mauser, I'm afraid. I mean, most Mausers have really good sights, but this one is this is not that good. <laughs> um, it's very, like, that's the little notch there, right? And then take a look at the front post sight here. Look at that, it's just this, it's just this little, like, triangle notch at the front, unprotected. So it ends up being this, this horrible kind of aim that you, aiming that you have to do. So the, the, uh, the sights on this one, yeah, this has probably the worst sights of any Mauser out there, but um, for its price, I mean, you can't you can't complain. Uh, some of the ammo I got here is uh, 1950s Austrian ammo, steel cased. Then I've got brass cased Yugoslavian 1940s Yugoslavian ammo, as well as 1960s Czech ammo. Any other ammo I get my hands on, I'll of course always do videos on. As far as uh, taking this guy apart also, the disassembly left. When it's on the left here, this little tab here, that's fire. Up is for easy disassembly. So it's on safe right now. It won't go off if I pull the trigger. And I can still pull the bolt back like this. And there's less resistance on the bolt when the uh, tab is up like this. When I flick it off to the right, the bolt locks up and it won't fire. So this is full safe here. This is kind of like half safe. Flicked off to the left, you're ready to fire. Taking the bolt off of the gun here is actually pretty simple. You just flick this up to the top here and then there's this tab right here so I can pull the bolt back like this and you pull this piece, bolt comes off just like that. That's how you do a kind of field stripping on this gun and it clicks right back into it like that. Dry firing this guy can damage the firing pin. A good easy way to put the firing pin down without damaging it or putting unnecessary stress on it. Take the bolt here, I'm holding the uh, trigger and then it sets the firing pin down slowly. But if you can notice on the G98 style rifles, when you click up like this, it resets the hammer, pull the bolt back. I've got a stripper clip with uh, snap caps here. And I'm gonna load this guy up. Clicks in just like that. And a neat thing with the G98s is, it slips the uh, stripper clip right forward, just like that. And just like that, all empty. One thing cannot be denied, this is by far the cheapest Mauser you can get your hands on. 
With good mid-range condition, reasonable prices, clock these guys at anywhere between 350 to 375. It makes it a very tempting buy. Not to mention, the one you might get could have seen action in a multitude of wars, with possible notable conflicts, depending on the rifle, obviously, ranging from the Italian-Turkish War, the Balkan War, World War I, Turkish War of Independence, World War II, and or even the uh, Korean War with very limited use. Not to say that, you know, you'll get a rifle that actually saw action, but there's always that chance. I will be doing a disassembly video in the future on how to take this rifle apart, as well as a more deep dive into my rifle and bayonet's markings to figure out more about the history of these two guys here. Thank you guys for watching this video. I hope you guys learned a thing or two about these old rifles. There's a whole bunch of kind of mysteries that come with this gun, and I highly recommend picking up one of these rifles, especially considering how cheap they are. Well, I've got nothing more to say. Have a nice rest of your day.